Welcome. This is this is Quinteto Latinos California Adelante. Adelante is the Spanish word for moving forward. So we're calling this series California Adelante, which is a three-part series where we're exploring the lives and careers of music of three California-based composers. Today we have Jesus Plasencia. My name is Armando Castellano. I have he, him pronouns. Um, I'm in my office here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I live in Menlo Park and um, on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people. And um, Quinteto Latino is an advocacy organization with a professional wind quintet. And we advocate on behalf of Latinos in classical music and Latino issues, building awareness around issues that impact us the most as Latinos. Um, and uh, I'm just going to put some links in the chat if you want to check out Quinta de Latino and more about what we're about. Um, like so many uh, Quinteto Latino events, we really hope, actually all Quinteto Latino events, we really hope that this can be a conversation, a conversation between our community, our audience members, our participants, and our composers, and all of us together here. And uh, we want to kick off that conversation by asking you to share, if you wish, in the chat some things. And, and uh, um, we're going to put in the chat what we'd like you to share. If you could share your name, any affiliations or organizations you want to share about, please put them in. This is where we get to learn about each other and find out about our community. Who's Quintato Latino community? Who is interested in Latino issues and classical music? So if anybody would be willing to put their name and uh, where you're from, your instrument, if you are an instrument or a musician or a composer. And, and this is a great way for us to build community. What I find with Quintato Latino communities, whether it be Seminario, whether it be our concerts, even our, our schools and is that uh, I find that we have a common interest in um, Latino issues or in BIPOC issues in classical music. And that there's, when we, when we talk about these issues openly and uh, with support, we uh, build community with each other. And I see so many projects come out of Quinta Latino events, chamber ensembles or other, other um, organizations and I think that if you can look at who's in the room here and everybody could be sharing in the chat, keep putting your name and your organization in the chat, your instrument, we can, it helps us to build community as well, um, um, knowing who each other are. Hey, Jamil, welcome. Another bassoonist. Oh my gosh, how many is that? Are we four, three bassoonists with Jamil here now? Um, lot, lots of double reads today. Thanks, you guys. So, um, so look in the chat about who's here, look them up right now, Google them, Google search them, you know, because these are the people you want to be talking to and connecting to. So thanks everybody. It's great. It's great to have you. So, um, before we go any further, I want to introduce our composer today, who is Jesus Plasencia. And, and, and my first question is, you know, um, what, t tell us, um, introduce yourself a little bit for just a few minutes. You know, we're trying to find out, one of the things I want to find out is what is a Latino composer today? But just start, let's, let's hear your name and, and where you are, et cetera. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure being here with you all. Um, like Armando said, my name is Jesus Plasencia. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm coming to you from my office in my uh, spare bedroom, my home in Los Baños. I live in Los Baños, California. I'm not sure if everybody knows a small town um, in the middle of nowhere off of 152, close to Gilroy, close to Fresno. Uh, very hot now. We got like 110 degree weather now. So uh, wow. this is the office where I've been, you know, remotely teaching um, last school. So I have all my instruments here. It's a bit messy because I have my, my books, my instruments, everything I used to teach. Um, so being a composer, you know, there's um, a lot of romanticized idea of, ideas of what a composer is and what a composer is not. You know, uh, this person that gets imp inspiration and all of a sudden starts writing, you know, writing something magical or something beautiful. And that's not the case sometimes. You know, being a Latino composer, um, first, first and foremost, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a brother. Um, I compose 
you know, what I, what I like, what I hear and what I dream sometimes, but it's not what people think. You know, I'm not, I'm not writing music 24 seven. I'm not thinking about it 24 seven. I have many other things that I do. So uh, I think that um, that's one of the things that people might, might think when they think composer, oh, he's just writing all the time and has tons of music, but it's, it's not that. There's so many other things that, that I do besides composition. That's great. And I think that I love building awareness around that, the full person we are as musicians, as artists, artists including composers. Um, one, one question I'd love to ask about all, and, I, and this is for our audience members too, how we, Jesus and I both identify ourselves as Latino, Latinx, Chicano, um, um, uh, Mexican-American, Hispanic, whatever you're using and why, just like a quick what it is, what do you use? If you use different ones at different times, tell me that and, and why to you. Should I, have one, I, I want to invite the audience also. Give me, let's hear how you call your, identify yourselves as Latinos. Which word do you like to use? Say, go ahead. Go ahead, Jesus. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, you know, after giving it, you know, thinking about it all the time, you know, everywhere you go, you have applications and you, they ask you, you know, what is your ethnicity? What is your race? And there's a bunch of little bubbles that you can fill up. And sometimes, you know, they don't, they're something, what you're looking for is not there. So what I want, what I call myself is Mexican American. I feel that I'm a second generation Mexican. Um, I was born in this country, but my ties are, I kind of live in two cultures, the Mexican and the American culture, because I'm so close to it still. My parents were born in Mexico. My grandparents were born in Mexico. So I'm, I'm really close to, to that country as well, even though I live in the United States. So um, Hispanic is somebody that speaks Spanish, but that's very broad. Latino is, I think, somebody from Latin America, but that's also very broad. So I, I like Mexican-American. That's what describes me the most. Great. And I invite audience members to put in the chat because this is a good place for us to learn. I, 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 why I like asking everybody that question in our audience is because I want to build awareness around that I, I, so often the Latino identity is seen as monolithic. And in fact, we're incredibly diverse. Food, language, identity, generation. Um, and, and, and I want to shine a light on that diversity. And so that people see us more as individuals and less as one massive group. We have things in common and there's a lot of things we don't have in common. So please, let's keep sharing in the chat about what words do you use? I use Latino, Latinx, um, Chicano, Mexican-American, sometimes I'm Mexicano, sometimes I'm Latino. It just depends on who I'm with and who, what's gonna bring power to the communities I care about for me. Great, thank you, Jesus, and thank you everybody for sharing um, in the chat. Um, I was trying to think about when when we worked together and how we met. Um, I can't remember how we met. I remember the project that we did together. Do you remember how we met? Yes, I remember exactly how you met. Oh, uh, great. I was, I was teaching at the uh, School of Arts and Culture, their, their uh, yearly summer mariachi conservatory camp. So I'm, I'm, I'm one of the teachers there. And as I was teaching our, our lesson, um, Tamara, you know, Tamara, the CEO at the time, I think you were walking with her and she was giving you maybe, a, a, I guess, a tour of what we were doing. And, and, you know, I saw you and I saw her and then you left. And then after the, the class was over, she comes up to me and she gives me your card and she says, you know, my friend Armando would love to talk to you. You know, I told him about you, how you compose music, how you're writing for us and you know, everything about you. And he was interested and he said, give him an email. So I emailed you and that's how we, you invited me to your home and that's how we met. That's great. And you know, um, that, that's so often how, um, when, when, when we as a quintet and my, um, how I curate who we choose for commissions, it often starts with a conversation like that, getting to know each other. I always tell my other artists, like when we're picking composers, we gotta pick people we like. First and foremost, we have to like each other. We have to share values. Um, and, and when we do, the projects turn out fantastic. And I felt like Jesus and I had a lot in common. Uh, um, I just uh, Maybe just a little bit about the uh, projects that we did, if you, uh, uh, Jesus, and your, your take on what we did together. Yeah, it, it was a wonderful time. Um, we worked with the Raven um, 
Palo Alto School District for Ravens. East Palo Alto uh, School yeah. District, Ravenswood, yeah. Ravenswood uh, in middle school, right? And um, um, I wrote uh, several pieces for the music classes there. It was a band and together with Quinteto Latino and the two orchestras with Quinteto Latino. So it was very fun. We were out at the class with, with the schools. We got to talk to them about different things. I got to interact with the kids. I heard them play. They gave me ideas of, of what to write about. They, they told me, you know, I, we like to play this. We don't like to play this. And at the end, it was a nice concert. Um, I got to meet the members of Quinteto Latino. They got to play my music. So it was a really wonderful opportunity for myself. You know, and that's, um, I want to shine a light on, the, the, in East Palo Alto on the Raven School District, it's majority Latinos. Yes. Um, uh, I think probably about 70% plus Latino and then Black and Pacific Islander and a few other mixed in there, mostly Latino. Mm -hmm. And it was so important to bring a Latino composer. Yeah. A composer that looked like the students and was a similar generation and a similar experience with familia, with parents, and um, and the same roots, and then the, and I loved how Jesus actually worked with the with the students to pull out stories and values and ideas, and wrote a piece based on the students' ideas. It was really nice. He also wrote uh, um, a large chamber work for a select number of students and the and the flute player Diane Gruby and I from the quintet to play at a conference where we I presented with the students. Uh, a two hour conference on the, the students did the conference with me and taught other teachers with me. It was fantastic. Yeah. And, and he wrote that piece. So thank you for doing that as well, Jesus, and being there with us. Well, um, I want to get into, you know, uh, uh, hearing from you directly about how you became a composer. You, you talked a little bit about what you do each day and what it's like and, 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 and how um, you as a Latino in particular infuse that experience and that coming up in, in your learning from, from early on and to what you're doing today. I want to really want to dig into that history there. Okay. Well, no. oh, wait, I'm sorry, before you do that, I want to, if anybody has questions or comments, please put in the chat anytime. We are going to be fielding questions throughout and be answering all your questions. So please just go ahead and throw some in there. Thank you. Sorry, Jesus. Go ahead. Okay, so, um, you know, my first experience with music was at, at seven years old, you know. Um, before that, we were just, you know, my brother and I, I have a younger brother, he's about two years younger than me. We were just playing, you know, Romer kids. And one day, you know, my uncle comes in with a, a trumpet and a clarinet and he starts playing them and, you know, that grabs my attention and, and he says, do you want to learn? I said, yes, you know, and I took my first, you know, lessons on trumpet from, from that uncle. And from there, you know, I just started learning as much as I could from people that were around me. You know, unfortunately, growing up in San Jose at the time, you know, private lessons were out of the question. Just, you know, there was no way that my family could afford them. So I just looked for people that were willing to share whatever they knew. And I played and I played and just kept going from group to group, learning from them. And eventually I started learning, you know, theory, writing, and that's when the composition started. I was always arranging, you know, started with arranging mostly different songs or they would ask me, oh, can you make an arrangement of this? Or can you make it harder? Or it's too boring or can you make it easier? It's too hard. So I would take it and figure out ways to, to change it and add new instruments to it. And that kept going until I, you know, I started composition. I kept telling myself, well, if I'm arranging music, you know, I'm, I can, arranging is sometimes composition. A lot of the times it is, you know, it involves composition as well. So I said, you know, if, if I'm doing all this, why can't I just start writing my own music? And I did, and I started writing um, for mariachi. Mariachi was my first experience, you know, growing up, um, the first music I came in contact with was mariachi through my parents. So I started writing my own sones, my own ballads, rancheras and everything. And I started giving them to different groups and they liked them and they, they would play them and they, you know, when I would hear them play, that would it would fill me with you know satisfaction or joy. I was incredible. It was just like hearing, you know, I used to write on paper before, not writing computer, but looking at the paper and in my mind now seeing the people play, the actual musicians performing was something that I said, you know, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. This is what gives me the most satisfaction, you know, in my life. So that's why I started composing. And my formal composition studies didn't start till. Um, I entered uh, the composition program at Sounds of State. So everything else was just, you know, trial and error, uh, reading a couple books here and there, 
um, working with other people that were composing, but my formal studies under a you know former composition teacher um, started at San Jose State when I met Dr. Pablo Furman. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a very accomplished composer himself. And uh, he took me in as, as one of his students. And that's when I started, um, you know, journey and he opened my eyes to, you know, to things that I didn't, being, you know, Mexican, I didn't even know about Carlos Chavez. I didn't know, I didn't know about Silvestre Revueltas, you know, and he, he knew my history about mariachi and he told me, well, have you heard music from Carlos Chavez? I'm like, no, who's that? And Silvestre Revueltas, no. Um, Arturo Marquez, no. He's like, whoa, you know, you've been living in this little bug when I said, yes, you know, that I've been living there. And he opened my eyes to their music and you know, I always going to be grateful for that because before that, you know, in my undergrad studies, I studied Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, everything, right? 12 tone series, all that, um, um, you know, wonderful music that I love, but none of those composers I felt represented me because their music was different than what I was used to. But the music of Carlos Chavez, the music of Silvestre Revueltas is, I can latch on to that because they use, Revueltas in particular, they use a lot of the same melodies and harmonies and rhythms that we use in mariachi and the music I was accustomed to. So he uh, opened my eyes to that and he encouraged me, you know, to look for my own voice. And you know, I'm, I, every time I write, I, you always, you're always looking for your own voice. I don't think a composer never finds truly his own voice. You know, we write maybe in the same style, but then something happens and we change or something, but I'm always looking for that voice that that is true to myself, you know, I don't want to be like anybody else, or I don't want to write something just to please someone or make it, you know, sound more like, you know, another composer or something, I want to be me, and he opened me to that, so, you know, I was very grateful for that, and very surprised that I hadn't heard about none of those great Mexican composers, you know, and that filled me with a lot of happiness, I was represented finally, and that's something that I, I take to my students now, you know, and I, I just want to be, before you go on, I hear that so much. Now, I want us to remember as community leaders, as activists in the field, how impacted you were. You, you had survived up to that point not knowing. But imagine being a child, considering that you want to be a musician and never having the opportunity to see a, compo a composer or a musician that looks like you or to hear music from your own culture and your own identity or even from musicians who have names that sound like yours and trying to survive going up in that pipeline without having that. And I think that's a, a one of the disconnection points that makes students, young students and old fall off the pipeline. They just don't see anybody that looks like them. So they don't think it's possible. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's, it, it feels like you're always in an uphill struggle. You know, you're, you're, you're always told what you need to do sometimes, you know, there's stereotypes that are laid out for you and sometimes you feel like you have to follow them because that's what everybody else is doing or at least I felt that way but you know I had to break out of all that all those negative people sometimes in your own family um, you know break away from all that and really you know doing what you really want to do I think um, so you know I'm still struggling with that today you know everywhere you know there's obstacles that you always have to jump hoops that you have to jump through so uh, you know, I think it, it, it never ends, even even today where everything is more accessible, but it's still, you know, it's still the challenges are still there. You know, one um, I, I in, re, in you relating to the the composers that you're hearing, you can hear your identity in the music. And I really find that with our audiences, too, with our Latino audiences and our BIPOC audiences, when they hear a more diverse composer palette and um, that they relate to it, not only the newness of the sound, the uniqueness of it, but also just in their own culture and owned it in who they are as people, they can feel themselves in the music and can, and, 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 and I, I feel like often in classical music, there may be a fear to move in that direction and move away from our iconic composers. But the opposite has happened with me when we play exclusively Latino composers, it's truly an audience builder and provides a unique experience. It's still entrenched in the Western canon and in Euro European Western language, but has this influence of the Latino identity. And it's a really unique and, um, and, uh, and, and um, compelling product of music to listen to. Um, and, and I just want to say another thing about and reaffirm what you were saying about timing and when you finally did hear composers 
and how late how much late it was or you were looking for resources around you but you didn't have um the privilege of like having lessons at a young age you know or um being um uh, having influence of uh family or colleagues that were musicians close by at hand to you and what happens is i find in in classical music is often we have wonderful music like you and many people on this call that maybe um matured slightly later or farther along because you started later and yet the field looks to younger people idealizes them and it it, it promotes a, a a further inequity when so many what i find a lot of bipop folks a lot of um uh, latino musicians are maturing a little later yet the field uh, idealizes these young folks again it perpetuates an inequity for us and 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 for us to be able to succeed often. I, I found that myself too. I, I also was 20, um, 24, 27 when I graduated undergrad, 27 years old. Yeah, that's exactly what I felt like when I started at San Jose State. You know, I came in and all of a sudden I felt light years behind all the other younger students. You know, right now I'm 37. You know, my I graduated in 2018. So I was one of the oldest people in, in always one of the oldest in my class, you know. And then here are these 19, 20, 21 year old kids that can play so much better than me. I started, playing, I played the trombone. And at state, that was also my first, you know, formal lessons with the trombonist in the trombone. Before that, it was on my own, you know, studying with other people or books or whatever. And I would beat myself up so bad in the practice room. Why can't I sound like those younger kids? You know, why? Why is it so harder for me to sound like that? And then I realized, you know, there was one example. I learned that one of the students that um, was one of the best trombonists at, at the school, he had been taking classes since he was in the fifth grade with the professor. And I was like, well, no wonder I can't be like him. There's no way I can catch up to yeah, that. Yeah. You know? So I was like, imagine if I had started in the fifth grade and had that opportunity, I would have had. And I felt like I was robbed of that in, in, in when I was growing up. In by you know, I felt like the public school system let me down because there was no opportunities in the 90s when I was growing up. There, it's much better now because I'm a teacher now. I see the opportunities getting better. But when I was there, you know, the teachers were not, you know, their, their mind was not what they are, what we are today. You know, I, I told Armando, Armando if I could share a, a story that happened to me um, in high school of how I was robbed, you know, of an opportunity, I think. And I want to share with all of you today, if that's okay. A story that you know, even though I'm 37 years old now, it still it still hurts when I when I tell it. It still brings you know memories, you know, you know sad memories of of what could have been. You know, um, here I am, you know, 15 years old, a freshman at um, you know Oak Grove High School, um, a high school that I'm not supposed to go to because you know another problem. I don't live by it, so that's another problem that we have. You know, my home school it was called. You know, I didn't want to go to it. I, I went on a tour and I decided that, you know, that school was not for me. So I, I pleaded with my father and he took me to the district and we he pleaded with the district. And then, yes, they, they got me into an intra-district transfer, they called it. And I went to Oak Grove High School. You know, my dream school with the, it was, you know, supplies, uh, everything, computers. Um, the band program was awesome. An award-winning marching band and everything, everything I wanted. So I'm there. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm in the marching band. I asked the director if I can join in. And he says, yes, as long as you have experience. And I did. I had a little bit of experience in middle school. I was in the middle school marching band, you know, marching in parade, that sort of thing. So he lets me in. But the problem is that this school is so far away that I have to take three buses to get there, three public school buses, because I cannot get um, school buses to go get me because it's not my school. So I have to ride three public school buses to get there. So school ends about 2.30, rehearsals don't start till like 6.30. So I have to go home and eat and do my homework. And then I have to catch three buses again and make it to band practice to, uh, for the marching band practice. So sometimes I'm late because I'm at the mercy of the, the, the bus schedule. So I'm, a lot of times I'm running a mile just to get you know, to practice. And a lot of times I'm late. So the teacher you know, just is furious every time I'm, I'm late because I'm like the only one. And all the other kids live around the school. They have their parents drop them off. So he's always giving me a hard time. And how, why am I late? And why everybody is not late? And it's only me and me and me. And, you know, and I'm also not as good as the other um, kids. Oak Grove is in a very uh, wealthy area of San Jose, Blossom Hill, Santa Teresa. 
and I live in the you know poor area, uh, Center Road Capital. I don't know if, I don't know if you um, familiar with San Jose. So the same story. All the other kids have private tutors or been playing in, in in other schools, and I'm here, you know, a little 15 year old shy boy that doesn't even speak sometimes because I'm so afraid of the teacher that just sits quiet and, and takes his his abuse. And at the same time. Everything's this point. I'm, I'm also playing mariachi. You know, mariachi has been has given me so much, and it's given me a, a way of life and a way to help my family. Um, I'm every I was helping my family since I was like 10 years old playing, and my income that I generated, you know, was used for food, bills, mortgage, rent, all that. So I'm always playing in the weekends, and you know, as I'm going through 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 the practice, you know, one day he announces this this fundraising concert. And it, it, it turns out it's the same day that I have to perform at the really you know, important gig that's going to pay me very really good money that I need because the rent is coming up and because I need new clothes or something. And I tell them, you know, there's like eight trombones. I have to miss this one because I cannot miss the other gig because I'm the only, I'm the guitarron player. The guitarron is the big instrument, the bass one. There's only one, it's possibly the most important instrument in the group, right? So if I miss, the group cannot play. So I tell them, I'm pleading with him, you know, I have to, I have to miss, I have to go because my family is depending on this income. And at that time, I'm very naive. I ask him, do you know, he asked me, why are you missing? I say, well, do you know what mariachi is? And he says, of course I know what mariachi is. It's a bunch of fat guys playing in a bar. And, you know, that I was stunned. I just had my trombone and I started shaking. I didn't know what to say. And of course, everybody starts laughing. And I just got really red and really hot and I felt like I was gonna faint. I said, why are you saying that? You know, we're not a bunch of fat guys playing a, and we, we play everywhere. You know, we play for weddings, we play for birthdays, we, pick, we make people smile, we brighten people's days. And why are you insulting, you know, my dad is over a hundred years old, it has full of tradition, full of history. You know, it's adored all, all over the world, not only in Mexico. So he says that to me and and, you know, I leave it at that. I don't answer him because, you know, I'm so afraid. And so I leave it there. And then after that, you know, at the um, uh, marching band practice, he sits everybody in the, in the, um, in the uh, band room. And we're all there sitting down. He starts, you know, going up how he wants to quit because people are not, people are showing late. People are missing concert. And he's looking at me. So he knows that he's blaming it on me. And he keeps going on and on. And then another girl answers a question and asks him, you know, why can't people just be here? Why can't people just be early on time? And he says, I don't know, ask him. And he points at me directly. And the whole band looks at me. And again, I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And then there I decided that I couldn't play anymore. You know, I couldn't be in the band anymore. So I started um, missing class. I started cutting class as they say that. I would hide in the bathroom, I would hide behind the gym, I would hide behind the janitor's quarters. Um, so the, you know, the security wouldn't find me and take me to the office. And that went on for a couple of weeks until finally it caught up with me. One of the counselors came in and, and took me from a classroom and he said, why have you been missing band? What's going on? And I told him the whole story and he said something very important that I won't forget. He said, he said blood is thicker than water. And he's like, I'll fix this. Uh, he put me in an art history class and that was the last band class I had, you know, I didn't do band at all through high school because of that. And what hurts the most is that this band director didn't care. He didn't find me. You know, I'm a teacher now. And if my student starts missing for two days, I'll call home. I'll call the office and I see what's going on. Why is he absent? Oh, he's in a trip. Okay, he's fine. But this band director never came to me. He never, you know, he had my schedule. He could go look at my schedule. He could have called home. He could have waited for me in one of my classes and said, you know, what's going on? Talk to me. Nothing. He never looked for me at all. And now, you know, all these years have passed and I think about it. You know, why didn't he? I think, I have no idea. I mean, was he, he was just maybe happy that I wasn't going to get any more trouble or he didn't have to deal with because I was different. In that time, I was like, you know, a handful of, of, of Mexican kids in Oak Grove. It was a predominantly white school that I didn't belong in. And I don't know if he did it because of that. I don't know because he, if he didn't just want the trouble of having to deal with all my issues. And, you know, to this day, I don't know. So even though this story, you know, hurt me a lot, it's taught me a great lesson that I use in my teaching now that I don't judge my students. I don't hold them to my standards. I don't inflict them with my biases because I have no idea what they're going through. I know what I went through. And most of these kids that I teach now, 
live the same life that I did. So I understand them. I know that they have working parents that they hardly ever see that they can't come to with problems because they don't understand. They're so busy, you know, backbreaking labor that they just want to come home and go to sleep. And that's what happened to me. So um, if students are late, if they're missing homework, you know, I don't come down. I talk to them. I try to find out what is going on before, you know, I never judge them. And that's what that, that, that horrible story taught me, I think. So I'm um, thank you for listening to that. Thank and yeah, thank you so much. It's still, you know, I'm shaking right now. It's, it's I bet. still, it's still I, I, after so many years. So grateful that you share that story and how important it is. And too often we hear stories like that. And I would, you know, have I know from my own experience as well, when that shaking feeling and, and inside of me, it's just like when I experience incredible racism. And I remember the number of times and 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 I've, and I've talked to many people even on this uh, webinar who have had that experience as well. And I just so appreciate you being involved and sharing it and also the way you turned it have turned it in and even further overcome it by um, taking it into account for your own students and the students that you teach to be for the full student that they are, you know, much more than just sitting in the band room. And so, and I think that's what makes you an amazing leader and an amazing teacher and an amazing composer as well. And um, I'm sure there are many reasons why that teacher did that and including racism. And I just want to name that word because it does exist and it still does and it did then and it still is now and it's still happening and these same stories are continue to happen. I hear them all the time with the students that I mentor and work with. It's, 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 a, it's a big system problem that we have. Yeah. You know, besides turning it into this passionate work that you're doing, it also, here, I hear that you put it into your music and I wanna, if, we, if you don't mind, taking that story and hearing how um, you know these the, your passions and your work and and those experiences have turned into some very powerful music as well, and play an excerpt if you don't mind us doing that now. Yeah. Um, and um, you know um, we're going to have Adriana tee off the piece. If you could just talk for a moment about what what the piece is and how it came to be. Yeah, sure. I wrote this piece uh, in my senior year uh, at San Jose State. It's actually, it was for a competition. The Alan Strange, another composer that used to teach us on the stage. Um, the Alan Strange Memorial Composition Competition, it's run by the San Jose Chamber Orchestra under Barbara Day Turner. And um, you know, the, the composers from, from the composing class are encouraged to write a, a piece and submit it for competition. And my piece won, I was so happy. And um, I named it Cacophony of Voices. Um, as you know, cacophony means, um, you know, different sounds or disjunct sounds coming at you from everywhere. And that's how I felt, you know, going to school, you know, people pulling me, you know, drop out, you need to go work and, you know, you have a family and, and how, you know, how are you going to, you need to go into construction and get a lot of money and support your family and all that. And other people, my composition teacher, no, you know, stay, get, get this degree. And all those voices talking at the same time kind of inspired me to write that piece and give it that name. And you will hear it, you know, that the piece is full of, of different voices, you know, coming at each other and fighting with each other and resolution and all. And I hope that that, that I transmit that in, 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 in the music. Thank you. This was great. Before we um, uh, go on to this excerpt, I have a couple of things to ask. One is that um, if you had joined a little late today, I still welcome you to, or if you want to put it again, put your name, your, if you are a musician, your instrument in any organizations or affiliations you have. Um, and I also just want to encourage if anybody wants to share a concert or an event that they're doing, please put it. This is a, I want Quinta Latino to be a community building place. One by sharing your, your social media, um, uh, sharing what you're doing next. Uh, I know a, a number of you here have some fundraising campaigns for different um, uh, uh, chamber music you're doing. Please share that here on the chat. I want us to learn about each other and build network together and mostly build power together so that we can have sway influence on the classical music field around how they're addressing Latino issues. Okay, so uh, here we are, Cacophony of Voices by Jesus Placencia. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Jesus. Thank you. We will, I just I really appreciate you, you know, having that for us to listen to. And um, I know you said you had some other news about your next, some upcoming projects that you yes. wanted to share. Yes, of course. I'm very happy to announce that um, uh, this last week, actually, Barbara Day Turner, the director of the San Jose Chamber Orchestra, uh, emailed me and then we chatted over the phone and they have um, commissioned me a new um Chamber orchestra piece, string orchestra. It's going to be their their top youth group, combined with the San Jose, San Jose Chamber Orchestra. So a really big group, and they want, you know, not all the t details are finalized, but it's about ten minute piece for strings, and maybe some percussion. So I'm very excited about that. Great. So I'm going to start working on that. I think they they want it by the end of February, so I have a couple months. Um, so I'm going to start working on that very soon. I'm very excited for the opportunity again. And so thankful for that. That's great. And I'm sure they appreciate having you to ask and, and that, you know, and you're willing to partner with them. You know, I always really try to build value for the musicians and the composers. I was just having a chat with the composer this morning from Tejas. And um, uh, I remember I, I told her, she's like, Armando, I got seven offers for commissions. And I told her, I hope you double or tripled your fee. Because when you, you know, I want us to build that we are worth it. As Latinos, this incredibly diverse experience you have is worth hiring and paying for, you know, um, and, and you've overcome so much and it shows in your music clearly. All right, we're gonna spend a little time answering some questions. If you have a question, would you mind either putting your chat, you can just raise your hand or put up your virtual hand, whatever you wanna do, and um, or put some um, uh, your questions here in the chat for these last few minutes that we're here. Uh, again, also, I wanna encourage you to put your events, go ahead and put a link, all right? Um, put, you wanna put your social media or your handle there, please do that because um, look each other up, um, I just find community uh, with Quintanto Latino communities, there's often so much instant trust with each other and, um, and the instant support and building community here. So please, um, anybody who wants to ask a question, please let us know or just come off mute or write it, uh, your question inside of the um, chat. So Kika, thank you for offering to um, ask the question. Can you come off mute and go ahead? Hi, uh, thank you, Jesus. This has been like a very cool way to spend the afternoon. It's afternoon for me. I don't know what time it is. That's, that's right. Yeah, so Kika <laughs> is a bassoonist from New York City who's actually subbed in Quinta Latino, and, and we've been working together for years. Thank you, Kika. Yep. Um, so I have a question about you said that you do mariachi conservatory. And so, um, like, de stratifying what we consider like high art and low art is very important to me like to me hip-hop mariachi classical music are all on the same like level of like cultural importance and so can you just tell me a little bit about your mariachi <laughs> conservatory or like how you're teaching it and how like uh classical training informs like being able to do something or it doesn't matter at all i'm just very curious how this like fits into your like business yeah, you know what course. i mean yeah, this is a program that I, I teach there um, annually during the summer months um, out of San Jose, the uh, major city here in California. And, you know, it's uh, ages 6 to 18, so elementary through high school. And, you know, we have kids that have been playing for a long time, kids that are beginners. Um, what we teach is I teach uh, the, the my main instrument, the guitar, and I also teach the music theory class. So I'm also teaching theory, solfege, and, of course, the history of, of mariachi. And... As far as um, um, classical music, did you say that if if it was did it help you or did it Im impact your classical training? Right. Yeah. Like if that has if that informs like your like educating a you know if that has informed your educational approach to mariachi or is it a bit a hindrance or no. like what do you think? No, I think it, it's helped me a lot. You know, learning you know by rote all those many years ago first gave me invaluable skills for mariachi, but also invaluable skills in classical music in jazz improvisation and all that. And then vice versa, what I learned in classical studying Mozart, studying Beethoven, you know, all that same, you know, I, I figured that all that harmony that's found in those, you know, hundreds of yield manuscripts is the same 
music that we're using in mariachi, the same thing. You know, what changes is, you know, the style, the way of playing it, just like it does in jazz, you know, a jazz trumpet player or a, a classical trumpet player. So I think that I, I like to get the best from both worlds and, and mix them in and then give it to my students that way. Thank you, sis. Thanks, Kika. And I, I want to reiterate, I don't know if most people know here, mariachis learn music by listening and repeating what they heard. It's not, uh, uh, you know, instinctively a written down music. They do it by ear. And it's an amazing thing to see. I, I've played whole projects with mariachis. They played all by memory, all the whole thing. Even new music that we learn, we learn the new music, they learn it all by ear. It's incredible. Okay, Chris, um, would you mind answering your question? Chris Pretorius. Chris is also, a is also a composer from the barrier, from the Santa Cruz, the southern part of the barrier. Who, and Chris will be our next composer guest for our, our next California Adelante. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, awesome piece, Jesus. I really enjoyed that. Great Chris. job. Um, I'm wondering, as a, as a composer, I, I felt a lot of pressure in music school to, to, to go towards atonality. And that for me just did not have any appeal to me because I also came to music later and I think everything that I grew up loving was rooted in some sort of tonality. And I'm just wondering like for your journey as a composer, what your relationship was to different sort of stylistic trends and if you, how you kind of dealt with that sort of pressure to, 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 to write modern music, which we often feel in, in school. Definitely, Chris, the same thing happened to me, you know, mariachi and is so it's, it's, it's a tonal music, right? And when I started at uh, San Jose State, I was for I chose, you know, Dr. Furman because he is Argentinian. So he is very well aware of the music of Mexico. He has been in Mexico. He's been composing all over the world. So he knows that music. So I said, you know, there's somebody that's going to know me. And he didn't he didn't guide me that way. But other students there, yeah, they were guided or they were by themselves very atonal music that I, you know, didn't understand and didn't, it just, I couldn't, I could write it. I mean, I, I have written serial pieces, but it's just not me. You know, I didn't have any fun writing them. So yeah, I, I thought, uh, um, you know, I stayed away from that. I, I didn't want to do that. And I was fortunate because my teacher, you know, he didn't, he, he wasn't pushing me in that direction because he knew of my background and he knew what I wanted to do. But yeah, the, 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 the push was there all the time. Thank you, Jesus. I want to also say, um, I feel like over the years, Quinteto Latino also has been on this journey between tonal and atonal music and contemporary music. And I think what, uh, what we found was, what I have found curating those concerts and selling them, because we sell the quintet, people purchase us performing and they pay for that, is presenting um, how we've got better about how to talk about contemporary music and more comfortable. Because we also started with things that were more atonal or folk-based instead of fine art music. And we've moved slowly over the years to um, things that are uh, more, uh, that are commissions and, and pieces that we like as musicians. It's often isn't necessarily tonal music or that's folk-based, you know, stuff that, that, that enriches our heart and our spirit and, our, and who we want to represent in classical music, the Latino voice. And um, so it's been also a journey for us as, mu as musicians, as curators, as, as chamber musicians, we get to curate what pieces we choose or not. All right, if there's uh, anybody have uh, another question, let us know. Oh, Evan has his hand up. Thank you, Evan, for asking. Evan is an amazing oboe player from the Los Angeles area. So, and, and has his own chamber music festival that he's um, re-kicking off post-COVID in the fall. So check it out. He put a link there. Go ahead, Evan. Hi, Jesus. It's good to meet you. And I really love that piece. Um, uh, could you give us more background into the piece? It's just, it's super interesting sounding. Um, and also what was the instrumentation? Okay, so um, yeah, the piece is, uh, thank you Evan again. Uh, it's string orchestra, so violins, violas, cellos, and uh, one string bass, I believe. And um, in the beginning, for instance, you hear a lot of uh, pizzicato, right? And that is very prevalent in, in mariachi. There's a lot of songs that use that so um, I've always liked that sound. And I said, you know, why not? Let me just write a bunch of music that has, that uses this a lot, you know? 
So that was one of the effects that I uh, that I, I I wanted to use. And um, sometimes, you know, I was I was writing this piece. You know, it's it's very personal because of everything that was going on at the time. So you hear, you know, when you hear these these acoustic sounds when the players. Uh, they call it a Bartok picks, right? Where, where they, 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 you know, they lift up the string and then it bounces back and hits the, 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 the wood. So, you know, all that I was, I, they're meant to be there because they were like shocks, you know, uh, to that I was seen at the same time. Um, and, you know, the other, I, you know, I kept thinking of everybody, all the, everything I was hearing. So all that, all the, how the lines are, are talking to each other and going all over each other and, creating dissonance sometimes and and just everything that I was trying to that was feeling at the same time. So I was doing my best to to describe what I was feeling through through the music. Thank you, Evan. Thank I you, also Evan. wanted to ask really quickly, could, can this piece be performed like size down, like for like a sextet or something? Yes, I'm pretty sure I can make an arrangement. Yeah, why not? Yeah, sure, definitely. Cool. Thank you. We, let's do one more question before we end here. A quick one from uh, um, Bennett. Go ahead, Bennett. Bennett is uh, also a noble player who's good, about to go to Los Angeles. So um, <laughs> right, we're soon enough, we're already there. Go ahead. Yeah. So I've been working and helping with family, which is kind of part of what I what I like to ask Jesus. Like when you're helping and working from your own perspective. I mean, how have you balanced your music life and your your work, your family life and work life as as you've kind of moved across your career? It seemed like it took a, a long time to find your your way in music, and and I personally find myself sometimes along that same line, um, really trying to figure out how I'm going to make a life in music. And so I'd love to kind of hear your kind of the path you took to get to where you are now. I mean, you, you're a great composer, you're a great teacher. So how how did it all come together once the degree was conferred upon? Thank you, thank you, Ben. And, um, yeah, it's 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 been one of the toughest and most difficult things for me to do balance the, that life, you know, gigging and writing music, and because I do have a, a family, three children, and you know they they need their attention too. So I'm um, think it's just you know when I'm gonna compose, I'm gonna compose, and I sit here and I tell them, and and when I'm gonna be with them, I'm with them, and you know nothing else distracts me. So you know, and, and that's how I approach it. I think as it works the best, you know, giving everybody their their time, you know, they know that when I'm working, I'm working, and when I'm with them, I'm with them. Um, as far as when I, my degree was over, I immediately started teaching in San Jose. So, you know, teaching there, um, I don't take my job home as much. You know, I try to do everything in the classroom. That way, I can have live my life after the classroom because I don't want to be one of those teachers that, you know, live in their classroom. That's impossible to do. So that's what I do. I, I take my, I leave my job as much as I can. And then I go home and I'm, I'm home. So I think that's the balance that I found that's worked with my family, what's giving me the most peace, I think. I love that. And, you know, and I, and I want, I love what, as we're ending here, um, this, this, this discussion of, of familia, a of family, and Latino classical musicians, it comes up all the time. When I do mentoring and conversations with musicians, almost always, there's a portion of our conversation that's about how they interact, react with familia, with family. And um, it's a big part of how we see the world and navigate the world. Uh, if, if there, I was mentioning there's some things that bring Latinos together in terms of identity. I think often familia and family dynamics is one of those. Well, this has been fantastic, Jesus. I just want to thank everybody once again for spending time with Quinta to Latino and um, all of us here. And please, I, I strongly encourage you to all connect with each other. Many of you know each other already. And, and as we continue to do that, I do want to say that this, our California Adelante um, uh, series was, is a project made possible with support from the California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I also want to mention that Quinteto Latino is a nonprofit ourselves. We have been for a little over a year, and your support of any amount to Quinteto Latino and a partner as a donor, no matter how small or how big, is greatly appreciated in our work as advocates in the field on behalf of Latinos in classical music and of composers, of musicians, and, um, and the field at large, and exploring and, and dealing with the Latino 
identity and costumes. So thank you um, for uh, uh, being here today. And I just want to thank Jesus as well. Oh, I do want to thank also our staff who's here today and our board members, including um, uh, 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 Adriana, who is behind our Quinteto Latino logo, uh, who is our uh, master coordinator. We also have Andre Temkin, who is our general manager. We have the wonderful Laura Hale here, who is a, com a committed uh, partner as a uh, not only as a donor but as a board member as well. She's been our founding of our founding board. We also have um, Quinteto Latino musician Sean Jones on on here, who was um, you know playing in that extra we played at the very beginning. And like I mentioned, Chris Pretorius, a composer who will be our um, the guest for our next who's also here on this call. So thank you, Chris, for coming. And um, thank you uh, all the um, staff and, and consultants that make Quinteto Latino keep moving forward. And our, of course, the, all of you that participated, your community who gives us so much and we, in, in, in terms of what voices we wanna expand in the field. We appreciate having you here with your questions and just your presence. So thank you everybody. And uh, we hope to see you on the next one. And it was just great if you could come off mute and just say goodbye and hi to everybody. We'd love to hear your voice. And thank you, Jesus, before you go, if you could, everybody can come off mute and just say hello. I'd love this. Thank you, Kathy, for coming. Hello, goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.